Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Eclectic Humanist, Season 2, Episode 6, and our continuing exploration of Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, where Lucretius celebrates the heroism of the intellect, debunks the notion that the world was made for us, spends a fair bit of time discussing evolution with something that sounds very much like natural selection, and culminates in a discussion of civilization, politics, ethics, and technology. The book begins with yet another celebration of Epicurus, but this time with a little more specific focus, which makes sense as we're further along in the argument of the poem, doesn't it? It goes something like this. Who can build a fitting song? Who has the strength of heart to match the majesty of things and these truths in his art? Or who has such a way with words his praise can reach the worth of him who sought these revelations and brought to birth out of his own intellect such gifts of wondrous good, and then bequeathed them to us, none, I think, of flesh and blood, for, Memmius, to speak in the exalted tones we need for the majesty of things, he was a god, a god indeed, who first discovered the way of living life we now call philosophy. For having found life tossed in a squall, he used his science in the dark and murky storm to steer into calm waters and safe harbor where the sky was clear. Take, for example, those ancient discoveries we call divine. It's said that Ceres taught men to grow grain, and as for wine, that Bacchus introduced the culture of the clustered vine. And yet life can be lived without these discoveries, for they say that there are tribes that live without them to this very day. But life was not worth living till the heart was purified. Thus he deserves his Godhead more, whose word now far and wide, being broadcast among the mighty nations, sweetly soothes troubled spirits with life's consolation, his great truths. That is, once again we're into the language of religion, aren't we? But once again, the object of devotion is something other than what we traditionally call divine. And this again is perfectly appropriate in a naturalistic cosmos, isn't it? Because the feelings of awe, the feelings of reverence that lie behind so many of our religious impulses are part of our psyche. But insofar as we poetically attribute, say, grain to Ceres or wine to Bacchus, or creation to whatever divinity you want to name, our tendency from a religious point of view is to direct that awe, to direct that reverence to the wrong object, to direct it toward things that are also part of our psyche, namely the gods, the divine, rather than where it really belongs, us. That is, in dispensing with the gods, Lucretius seems to be arguing and really only in dispensing with the gods, can we appreciate the true majesty of humanity. And it's the struggle against the errors and the institutions that would have us take our myths as real, take our myths as historical, that mark the heroism of the human intellect in its struggle against superstition, for which Epicurus quite explicitly takes the place of heroes such as Hercules and their struggles against their mythological foes, which themselves can actually pose no threat to us, whereas ignorance and misattribution of causes still can. But of course, if there are causes, if there are beginnings, there must be ends, and Lucretius doesn't back away from what he sees as the fact and what seems to be the fact that the world itself will end and end not as some divine cosmic judgment, but simply as a result of material causes. As, for example, we now know that in about five billion years, the sun will expand to a red giant and engulf the earth within its atmosphere, and sometime trillions and trillions of years in the future, it looks like better than 50-50 odds that the universe as a whole, or the observable universe as a whole, will subside into perpetual heat death have a nice day. But of course we could be wrong. And it may seem strange to include this notion in a poem of consolation to an individual friend agonizing over his fear of death, but Lucretius argues for intellectual courage, for not backing away from threatening topics, even if they challenge our desires for, for example, eternal life. 
and even if they make us viscerally aware of our own individual smallness relative to the cosmos as a whole, there's this interesting tension in Lucretius between the vastness, the eternal vastness of the cosmos on the one hand, against which we are relatively, well, almost nothing, and the value or the worth of the individual, of individual experience in the individual psyche. And this makes sense, doesn't it? If meaning itself arises from the human psyche, that is, if it is part of the material configuration that is us, if it's something that we do, then the cosmos itself only has meaning through us or through sentient beings. That is, the great big everything else doesn't confer meaning or significance to us, doesn't confer majesty to us. We confer it. But of course, there are ears to which that must seem blasphemous, aren't there? And Lucretius is aware that these may be difficult ideas for readers and listeners to wrap their minds around. After all, to a psyche accustomed to abasing itself before some imagined divine from which all good springs, while attributing to itself its own failings and deficiencies, the notion that humans are in a sense the wellspring of sacredness must come across as blasphemous, as hubristic. Whereas with his language of Epicurus, for example, being deserving of godhood, what Lucretius seems to be getting at here is that human beings have an innate worth, have an innate dignity, and that dignity arises from our inborn potentials, from our capacity to understand. Whereas to attribute that worth, that dignity, to mere mythological figments is a profound betrayal of ourselves. What is not a betrayal of ourselves, though, is to recognize the fact that the world was not made for us, a topic Lucretius brought up in Book 2 and promised to get back to later, and, well, now is later. And it's in Book 5 where he addresses the fact that much of the world, and most of the cosmos, is actually inhospitable to human life. Let's pick it up at line 218. Also, what's the reason nature multiplies and feeds the enemies of man on land and sea? The bristly breeds of brutes, how does it come about disease abounds at the change of seasons? Why does death make his untimely rounds? A human baby's like a sailor washed up on a beach by the battering of the surf, naked, lacking the power of speech, possessing no means of survival, when first nature pours him forth with birth pangs from his mother's womb upon light's shores. He fills the room up with his sorrowful squalls, and rightly so. Just think what lies in store for him. Life's full supply of woe. But herds and flocks and droves of animals, both tame and wild, when growing up, do not need rattles like a human child. They have no use for lullabies. They do not need to be coddled with the baby babble of the nursery. They do not need a change of clothes according to the season. And last of all, they have no need for weapons and no reason for towering walls to keep belongings safe. The very earth and crafty nature bring forth all they need. They know no dearth. And while his description of life in a state of nature is, I think, unrealistically rosy, he does make some good points here. For example, if the world were made for us, it's difficult to explain the degree to which our ancestors were the object of predation before they developed the technology to fend the predators off. It's difficult to explain disease and natural disasters for that matter. There's no difficulty explaining these catastrophes from a naturalistic point of view. In fact, they're exactly what you would predict would happen. But the intellectual hoops that one must go through to justify these in order to bring the world into conformity with some pre-existing notion of a divine creation quite frankly boggle the mind. That is, the presumption that the world was made for us introduces, without any evidence, a problem that then must be solved in spite of the evidence. That is, with a great deal of post hoc rationalization, with myths such as, for example, Pandora's box, or the serpent in the garden. 
both of which Lucretius would certainly have been aware of. And when I say that suffering is easy to explain in the absence of any special creation, all I mean from Lucretius's point of view is that the same natural processes involved in the lives of other animals are also involved in us. The same types of thing that afflict their bodies afflict our bodies. And like them, we are limited in the number of environments in which we can live unless, of course, we invent or construct technological aids, to which we will get shortly. Before we do, though, we need to discuss at least a little bit of his argument about not just why, but how the world is perishable. And by the way, when we're discussing naturalistic causation, why and how are effectively the same question. As for how we know the world will end, Lucretius appeals to the only thing to which he can appeal, the evidence. And I'm not going to read the poetry here, just sum up. He references erosion, which he was very much aware of, and which was, by the way, a key element in the argument for a very old earth that ended up coming out in the late 18th and early 19th centuries with the establishment of the science of geology. He refers as well to natural decay patterns and to the water cycle. All of these point toward the impermanence of the things that we can observe around us for the simple reason that they are not whole in themselves but composed of minuscule individual parts which can be added on or which can be taken out. As he says at line 351, there are three types of things that last forever, those that being utterly solid in their substance shrug off blows and which prohibit anything to penetrate inside the close-knit fabric of their parts to rend them and divide, atoms are of this type, as I have shown you not far back, or else the reason things can last forever is they lack anything to do with blows, such as void which is not affected since blows cannot ripple emptiness one jot. Or else it is because there is around them no supply of space into which their parts are able to dissolve and fly, just as the universe, the sum totality, will last forever since there is no other place beyond and past the universe for things to leap to, or place whence there could come hard blows to rain upon it and to shiver apart the sum. That is, with the exception of atoms, the void, and the cosmos itself, everything is simply a configuration of atoms in space, and configurations are all mutable. And one of the consequences of that mutability is, of course, us. Let's talk about how. And as for the account of us, between lines 772 and 1104, Lucretius gives a pretty good account of evolution. And he begins, as he must, with the emergence of life itself through natural forces. Now, here I need to be perfectly clear. Scientists studying abiogenesis, which is the process by which what we call life emerged from what we call non-life, have yet to identify exactly what happened. And given that the record of life, the fossil record of life on Earth, goes back to not too many hundred million years after the Earth had cooled enough to be able to sustain life. That is to say, it appears as if life is not that difficult for chemistry to do, given enough time. But as I said, given that this was so long ago, the odds of hitting upon the exact process that exactly gave rise to us are very, very low. But as I said, and as Lucretius has pointed out more than once, the objective in naturalistic questioning is to come up with viable options, viable explanations, explanations that fit the evidence, that fit the data closer than anything else, always with the proviso that you could be wrong and that you probably will be wrong. In fact, I remember my very, very first day of university at the University of Toronto, my first class was psychology with Professor Gilmore, and he was a brilliant, brilliant teacher. His first words to an entire class of 1,500 brand spanking new university students were as follows. Everything I'm going to teach you is wrong. We don't yet know how it's wrong and we don't yet know why it's wrong, but someday it will be shown to be wrong. In the meantime, this is the best we can do. That is how 
naturalistic knowledge works. So, to get back to abiogenesis, as we get closer and closer and closer to understanding how chemistry became sufficiently complex to be called life, that barrier of ignorance gets, of course, pushed farther and farther back on the understanding that it might never be completely eliminated. But as long as we keep asking questions that we can test, or proposing hypotheses that we can test, we never have to wave that intellectual white flag and say, oh, well, we're just going to attribute that to the divine. Lucretius attributes nothing to the divine, which, as he and I have said over and over again by this point, is, as far as he's concerned, just a metaphor. So, as I said, Lucretius taking his cue from Epicurus, who of course takes his cue from earlier Ionian thinkers, attributes the arising of life on earth to natural processes. But of course, he also recognizes, Lucretius and Epicurus both, that life didn't arise as it is now. That is, we didn't come into the world fully formed according to our kinds, as the saying goes but rather are the product of impersonal natural forces. This, of course, makes sense from a naturalistic point of view, because no matter how long you stir a puddle of primeval goo, it's never going to turn into a human being. We are far too complex for that. So life as it first emerged from the primeval conditions had to be simpler than what we encounter now. And to flash forward to contemporary thinking, which I'll be doing a fair bit through this segment, I do have to highlight the fact that we don't even have a consistent definition for what life is. One thing we can say, though, is that life is a category of thought. There's a threshold of behavior within which we call something a living thing and outside of which we don't. And we need to remember that that definition is itself an artifact, a product of thought, a product of consciousness. And Lucretius has been very clear that we are deceived more easily through the categories of thought we carry around in our heads than through what we actually receive by our senses. That is, we don't want to get hung up on what is ultimately an artificial border, when the case seems to be not a hard line between all of a sudden there being life when before there was non-life, but rather a kind of a gray zone, as there is also a gray zone between ancestor and daughter species. Species themselves, as any biologist will tell you, being labels that we put on things, objects of discourse, to aid our understanding, but not real concrete things in themselves. That is, this is a process of slow change over time that does not come with pre-made categories for our cognitive convenience. But to anchor things in the text, let's take a look at what our boy here has to say. And we'll go from about line 837. In the beginning, yes, he is choosing that phrase in full knowledge of where it comes from, there were many freaks. I think I'm going to read that one again because I like it so much. In the beginning, there were many freaks. Earth undertook experiments. Hermaphrodites partaking of both sexes, but neither. Some bereft of feet or orphaned of their hands, and others dumb, being devoid of mouth, and others yet with no eyes, blind. Some had their limbs stuck to their body, tightly in a bind, and couldn't do anything or move, and so could not evade harm or forage for bare necessities. And the earth made other kinds of monsters too, but in vain, since with each nature frowned upon their growth. They were not able to reach the flowering of adulthood, nor find food on which to feed, nor be joined in the act of Venus. For all creatures need many different things, we realize, to multiply, and to forge out the links of generations, a supply of food first, and a means for engendering seed to flow throughout the body and out of the lax limbs, and also so the female and the male can mate, a means they can employ in order to impart and to receive their mutual joy. Then many kinds of creatures must have vanished with no trace, because they could not reproduce or hammer out their race. Okay, let's pause on this one because this is huge. While well, he simply has to intuit guess about what previous species may have looked like, his argument here is 
basically the argument for natural selection. Some bodies are more capable of providing for themselves, that is, of feeding themselves and of avoiding being eaten, for long enough to reproduce. Those that survive long enough to reproduce will, and those that don't, won't. And therein, along with the tendency of nature to produce things that are not exact copies of the things from which they came, that is, the tendency of nature to produce a wide variety of things, these two facts combined account for natural selection. This is natural selection. This is an argument for evolution by natural selection being made in the first century BC. The principal difference between Lucretius's hypothetical argument, because this has to be a hypothetical, he has no data, and the argument for evolution by natural selection put forward by Darwin and Wallace, and since built upon to the point of irrefutability by generations of biologists and scientists working in other disciplines, is exactly the presence or absence of data. The logic is consistent. That is, even though he doesn't know how many species must have gone extinct, he knows some must have. And the modern world isn't the only world to have fossils. We have more of them, we know more about them, we go looking for them, and we have a better understanding of how they're made, for example, how old they are and what they indicate. But the ancient world also had fossils. They had signs of previous types of life having existed on the earth, bones that didn't correspond to any known creature. So he is, broadly speaking, on pretty solid ground here. And he is demonstrably correct in pointing out that natural variation and natural selection are by themselves sufficient to account for the full complexity that we observe in the living world around us given enough time. And whereas Lucretius didn't know, had no idea how old the earth was, he didn't think it was terribly old actually, we now have a better account, again coming from multiple directions, from multiple branches of science converging on the same conclusions of the actual age of the planet. So he was right as far as it was, I think, humanly possible for a person to be right, given the information he had to work with, given the limitations on the observations that could be made in his time. And he even draws an example that teachers of biology still use to this day to illustrate how evolution works. He draws an example of artificial breeding, of artificial selection. Because, of course, the same processes are involved, aren't they? We choose, for example, what dogs we want to mate with other dogs or what plants we want to pollinate, and by doing that, we change the things themselves. We create, and have created, new species. What follows necessarily, though, and Lucretius recognizes this, is that the characteristics of individual species are not fixed. That is, there not only is no permanent life for any individual human being, there isn't even a permanent human nature, humans having arisen from prior life forms, and that once something was there that we could call human, that doesn't mean it stopped changing. In fact, it didn't stop changing, and Lucretius is wise to this too. So let's pick him up around line 925. But back at that time, on the plains, the race of humankind was far more hardy, as befit the very hardness of the earth that had engendered it. And they were built on scaffolding of bigger, denser bone, fixed with brawny sinews throughout the flesh, and weren't as prone to being overwhelmed by heat or cold, could stomach all kinds of changes in their diet, and they did not fall ill from any sickness. For many a cycle of the blaze of the sun rolled through the heavens and dragged out their days, like far-roaming wild brutes nomadic in their ways. Back then there were no sturdy plowmen to guide the curving plow. No one knew how to work the land with iron tools, or how to plant young slips in soil, or cut the barren branches down from the tall trees with pruning hooks. Wherever the sun and rain provided them, wherever the earth unasked for would impart, there they found these things were boon enough to satisfy the heart. And once again, he's intuiting something that is broadly speaking correct. That is, we of course are shaped by our environment, he's established that through his argument for natural selection. 
But our environment is not merely what we call nature. He posits human beings before what we now call the agricultural revolution, which happened about 12,000 years ago, as being brawnier than we are now, as being more muscular, as having heavier bones. Well, guess what? The dude was right. Our muscle to bone ratio has gone down over the roughly 200,000 to 300,000 years for which our species has existed. And of course, even that earlier higher ratio of muscle to bone, even those earlier bulkier frames, were themselves less muscular, less robust than the species from which they emerged. Species that themselves had developed earlier forms of technology, for example the hand axe, that could offload some of their chewing and digestion for them by processing food externally. Or to put it another way, Lucretius posits correctly that the human form is now evolving along with the technology that we use and therefore being shaped by it. Now, if you want a couple of good books to read on exactly this subject, check out The Artificial Ape, How Technology Changed the Course of Human Evolution by Timothy Taylor, or and this one is really interesting, The 10,000-Year Explosion, How Civilization Accelerated Human Evolution by Gregory Cochran and Henry Harpending. The argument in that second one particularly is, is fun because it basically begins with the agricultural revolution and works forward and argues for an acceleration of human evolution since that time countering what had been the prevailing wisdom during most of the 20th century that human evolution had largely stopped due to our reliance on technology and due to the cultural mechanisms that we have for looking after the weak. But as long as we're on the topic of technology, we should probably say a little bit about that. One point that's worth noting is that his discussions of evolution and technology overlap. That is, he attributes the rise of technology to purely human agency. Prometheus didn't steal fire from the gods, and in the Prometheus myth, fire is a metaphor for technology, but rather we observed fire, saw how it worked, and figured out how to do it ourselves, going from sensory data. Now, if you want to read the account of Prometheus giving us technology as the stolen fire of the gods, read Aeschylus's tragedy, Prometheus Bound. This would be assumed background reading, assumed knowledge for Lucretius's initial audience. And many of the technologies that Lucretius names, fire, sailing, armies, agriculture, and socially, law and politics, these are presented as social technologies. Aeschylus addresses those as well. But of course, again, the fire, the spark, comes from the divine. It's something that comes from us and is imparted to us. Whereas for Lucretius, it arises from us. It is us. That is, it's an extension of our evolution. And this is why I think those two sections overlap. Because, as I've already mentioned, he's already discussed the way or some of the ways in which our use of technology has affected our physical form. He notes, for instance, once people had drawn together in simple communities, now of course he didn't know that we evolved in communities, then neighbors began to form the bonds of friendship with a will, neither to be harmed themselves, nor do others ill, the safety of babes and women folk in one another's trust, and indicated by gesturing and grunting it was just for everyone to have mercy on the weak. Without a doubt, occasional infractions of the peace would come about, but the vast majority of people faithfully adhered to the pact, or else man would already have wholly disappeared. Instead, the human race has prospered to this day. That is, even prior to language, he suggests, we come together in community, in mutual cooperation, and recognition of mutual interest. And this is basically the beginning of ethics as understood as a social contract, even before we could articulate what a contract actually is. But that comes soon afterward. But it was nature gave the tongue its different sounds to say, and expedients that formed the names of things much the same way, 
We see infants are driven to point their finger and to reach at what they want to show precisely from their lack of speech. A sense of what its powers are suited for is given to each. The young bull, even before the horns have sprouted from its head, already tries to charge and butt with these things seeing red, while whelps of panthers and the cubs of lions already fight tooth and nail when they have scarcely any fangs to bite or claws to scratch with yet. And we've seen how a fledgling flings itself into the air, trusting the wobbly aid of wings. And therefore, to assume there was one person gave a name to everything, and that all learned their first words from the same, is stuff and nonsense. Why should one human being from among the rest be able to designate and name things with his tongue, and others not possess the power to do likewise? Moreover, if he had never witnessed others using words before, then how did the idea of speech first germinate and grow, and where did he get the concept of its usefulness to know in his mind what he wished to do? He wouldn't be able to intrude and force his will a single man's upon the multitude so that they wanted to adopt his names of things. It's clear that it is difficult by any means to make men hear what is needful to be done when they turn a deaf ear, for they would not have borne unheard of utterances a minute grating on their ears, and they would see no purpose in it. Why should it be so wonderful the human race expresses different things and feelings with different sounds, since it possesses such marvelous instruments of tongue and voice? When you take dumb flocks and even all the creatures in the wild, they make a range of sounds and voices in a wide variety. When they are terrified or in pain or burst with glee, this is quite obvious from observation, as you see. So, for Lucretius, language is also an emergent phenomenon arising from the specific properties of our organs and our tendencies to communicate with each other, developing from those initial grunts and gestures that he points out in the previous passage that I just read you. And this, of course, is a perfectly naturalistic and reasonable account of where language comes from. Without resorting to an initial namer, or on the other hand, a myth of a, a single initial language magically fragmented into other languages for whatever reason. And of course, because language for Lucretius is a natural development, it stands to reason that human beings aren't necessarily the only ones who employ it. And we now know, again as Lucretius didn't and couldn't know, that other species do do something that looks an awful lot like language. Whales in particular, I'm thinking of, some species of whale even have names. That is, because our capacities are naturally emergent, there's nothing saying they can't emerge elsewhere. He also makes an interesting argument here about the relationship between language and thought. That is, we think in language, so language and thought would then necessarily, very much like evolution and technology once they got going, move forward in tandem, influencing each other in an active and organic progression. And in this sense, in the sense that language actually enables most of our thought, and language is a natural phenomenon, that is, language is something that arises from the type of thing that we are, then thought as well is entirely natural. And in fact, the border between natural and unnatural, nature and technology, becomes, in Lucretius's own argument, I think, a little bit problematic. But in any case, with language, we are able to have such things as cities and laws. And as I suggested before, Lucretius proposes a notion of justice or ethics that is basically a social contract. That is, a willingness to limit our desires in return for other people limiting theirs. Or as he says it at 1140, for men are eager to trample underfoot what they before had held in too much awe, and mankind was reduced once more to chaos, the very bottom of the barrel, as each sought power and glory only for himself. Later, some taught men to establish a constitution, set magistrates in place, that people would want to live by laws, because the human race, weary of leading all their days in violence, bled dry from constant clashes, were all the more eager to put by their own will and submit to the rigid rule of law. 
Each man was ready, out of rage, to avenge himself more fiercely than would be allowed under today's impartial laws, and hence people were sick to death of spending their lives in violence. It is from this arises the fear of punishment that spoils life's gifts, for violence and wrong ensnare all in their toils, and, for the most part, crimes rebound upon their author's head. Neither is a quiet retiring life easily led by one whose hand has shattered society's pact of peace. And I'll stop there. Society's pact of peace is a contract. That is, for Lucretius, the basis of law, the basis of ethics, in fact, is a contract. There is no absolute morality, but there is an objective morality. It's important to distinguish between these two things. Absolute morality is something that is right or wrong, regardless of context at all times and in all places. Objective morality, on the other hand, can have a relatively arbitrary beginning, such as the mutual desire to not die. But from there, there can be objectively assessed means of going about attaining that end, much as there's no absolute reason why the rules in, say, a chess game need to be the way they are, but once you're in the game, you're also bound by the rules. So the ethics that Lucretius proposes, we'll call these humanist ethics, are not absolute, but they're also not completely subjective. They're in that middle ground of objective, goal-oriented ethics. And anyone who's ever read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan is going to find this whole argument really, really familiar. In any case, I think it's really important to point out that Lucretius suggests a viable way by which a system of ethics can arise from a context of self-interest without any moral dictates from above. And speaking of dictates from above, Lucretius also proposes, and really has to propose, an argument on the origin of religion, his biggest target. And he doesn't attribute it to nefarious causes. I think I need to be really clear about that. Let's take a look at what he says from 1161 onward. As for religion's origin, that's easy to unfold. The reverence of the God that everywhere has taken hold of mighty nations, their cities awash with altars, and the ways of worship it established, the sacred rites that thrive these days among great lands and peoples, and the dread rooted inside men even now that builds the gods new temples far and wide, and makes folks congregate on holy days, the cause behind all this, even back then, men saw with wakeful mind the images of gods, and even more so when they dreamed, surpassing beautiful and wondrous tall, and since they seemed to move their limbs and speak and exalted and speak the exalted tones that men thought right, as befit such gleaming aspects and such superhuman might, men ascribed sense to them, and granted they would never die. Since the images refreshed from a perpetual supply, and their forms were changeless, Especially, men thought beings endowed with such great powers could not by any force be easily bowed, and that is why they thought them blessed in their happy lot beyond all mortals, since the dread of death oppressed them not, and also because men saw them in their dreams do many a thing, marvelous to behold, all without any laboring. Moreover, men observed the orderly movements of the heavens, and beheld the cycling of the year with its returning seasons, but could not fathom how these came about, and lacking reasons found an escape by handing these things over to the gods, and supposed all things came about by supernatural nods, and established the seat of the gods up in the quarter of the sky, for it's through the heavens we see night and moon go wheeling by. There moon and day and night and somber zodiac all turn and torches wandering by night and gliding stars that burn and there the clouds, the sun, the rain, snow, hail, storms, lightning bolts, thunder loud grumbling its threats and sudden shuddering jolts. O oh, foolish race of mortals that gave God such jobs to do, then went and made them fierce with anger into the bargain too. What groans you purchased for yourselves, what grievous injury for us, what tears you fashioned for the children yet to be. 
It is not piety to cover up your head for show, to bow and scrape before a stone, or stop by as you go at every altar, flinging yourself upon the ground face down, lifting your palms at the God's shrines, nor piety to drown altars in the blood of brutes, nor chain prayer to prayer, rather to look on all things with a mind that's free of care. And okay, there's a lot there, isn't there? Religion for Lucretius comes from an attempt to understand. We need to establish that right off. People observe, for example, the regular movements of the stars. They don't know how it happens, and they attribute it to the gods, these figures of their dreams, these images, that they imagine to be transcendent to them. Moreover, he notes that religion does serve a communal binding function. It gets people together to do public works, make temples, for example, and gather for public worship, and whether the object of worship exists or not, one could argue that this serves a positive public function in bringing the community together. But of course, community is something that we do naturally. Lucretius has already established this. Where he thinks we go wrong, and he thinks we go radically wrong here, of course, is attributing those powers to the gods themselves rather than trying to figure things out. That is, giving the gods credit when we don't know the cause. This is a way of making ignorance look respectable, basically. And in fact, as far as Lucretius is concerned, religion as a whole is not a form of piety, but a distraction from genuine piety, which he sees as, once again, to look on all things with a mind that's free of care. Or, a little later, he addresses the awe we feel at natural phenomena, grand natural phenomena, often destructive ones, such as, for example, earthquakes. And where we don't understand the causes behind these things, it's understandable to attribute them to things beyond our comprehension. But true piety for Lucretius is exactly that attempt at comprehension which is an investigation of things, an investigation of the world in which we live. Or to put it another way, for Lucretius, religio is both an impediment to understanding and a thief of piety. And it's on that question of piety that we come to the arts, which he also attributes entirely to human agency, be they poetry, music, weaving, what have you. That is, a poem that begins with an invocation of the muse, an invocation of the goddess Venus, who in Book 4 we saw reinterpreted or clarified as simple erotic desire, now attributes all the arts, every single one, every human attainment that we achieve through our understanding and control of the world through which we move, that is, our technology, to human agency. Or as he puts it, at the end of Book 5, seamanship and agriculture, law, fortifications, weaponry clothing, roads, and all these sorts of innovations, the prizes of life and absolutely everything that's fine, poetry, painting, statues, cunningly wrought and made to shine, by trial and error, and probing, restless intellect, day by day, step by step, these skills were taught to man, feeling his way so incrementally, time brings all things within our sight, and reason lifts them up into the boundaries of the light. For men saw one thing after another clearly in their hearts, till they ascended to the very summit of the arts. That is, in Lucretius's view, not only did the human form arise naturally from previous forms, but in the sense of what makes us human in the cultural sense, it's us. We make ourselves human. We have made ourselves human from Lucretius's point of view. Or, to be more blunt about it, and if I can echo with a slight twist the final passage from Darwin's On the Origin of Species, we have created and are creating ourselves. And on that note, which I at least see to be very optimistic, I think it's time to wrap up this little talk. Next week, we'll conclude our discussion of Lucretius with, oddly and I guess appropriately for the time we're living in, a description and account of life during a plague. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. 
If you want to get a hold of me, I am, of course, at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com, Eclectic Humanist on Facebook, and at EC Humanist on Twitter. And if you're enjoying these talks, please share them. I'm trying very hard to get my listener numbers up, but quite frankly, I can't do that without your folks' help. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, by all means, feel free to like and subscribe or even make a comment if you happen to listen and find something you agree with or disagree with or have further questions about. But regardless of likes and dislikes and subscriptions and agreements and disagreements and questions, whatever you get up to between now and the next time we get to share a little time together, please, as always, be kind to each other. 